recorded. This is the Red Ticket Blues Podcast. I am Brian Buckley. This is hitting the internet on July 26, 2016 in the middle of a thunderstorm. So if you hear thunder, it's not my booming voice. It's actually thunder. All right. Anyways, um, so we're doing the Thursday guest podcast on Tuesday, so I don't want to confuse you. You know, summer hours, you just go crazy. So if you're new to the show and you want to hear more episodes of me rambling and uh, guests actually giving facts, you can go on iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, YouTube, and Google Play. So this week we have Chris Nimbly. He is the editor-in-chief beat writer for JetsInsider.com and NYJScout.com. We talk some Jets training camp starts on Wednesday the 27th. So we go over what happened last year, what they did in the offseason, what we're looking forward to this year. So... Uh, I hope everyone will enjoy that. I don't have to hope. I just know you will. All right. You will enjoy it. So here, here's the thing, though. I just wanted to tell you about SeatSwapTickets.com. You've heard me talk about it. And guess what? If you haven't, well, I'm going to tell you now. So listen up. All right. It's all about, you know, that time when you really wanted to go see the Mets or the Yankees play. Or you wanted to see a concert. You want to see Wicked uh, on Broadway. And you know what? Shit happens. Can't go. You can give them to a family or friend, but, you know, it's usually pretty hollow and you and, you just don't get anything out of it. Or you can just hold the tickets as you watch the game on TV and feel even worse about yourself. Or you can go to SeatSwapTickets.com. So how are they different? Why would you go there? Well, you're going to sell your tickets or you're going to buy tickets. You're going to interact with other people. It's not some ticket brokery site that has the same tickets for every, you know, go, go, you go to every site and it's like, well, didn't I just see that exact one location there? Is this some sort of Nigerian scam where I have an uncle that had a plane crash five years ago? Something. Who knows? feel comfortable. There's people with actual profiles. They, they, they're they fans just like you. So if you want to buy tickets or sell tickets, th- that's where you go. You go to SeatSwapTickets.com. And for the red, special, special Red Ticket Blues listeners, guess what? That's all of you. That's all of you. Uh, they're, they they want to tell you about an exclusive offer right now. If you want to learn more about SeatSwapTickets.com and if you want to see how the site works, they're going to give you a behind-the-scenes tour. So you're going to contact them at, you're going to contact Dan with the email address of dan at seatswaptickets.com or Josh at the email of josh at seatswaptickets.com. Remember, the only place on the entire internet that you can find a place to safely swap tickets with other fans, with other fans, they're, they're actual fans, is seatswaptickets.com. That is seatswaptickets.com. Turn your volume up, seatswaptickets.com. Seatswaptickets.com. Let's talk to Chris. He is editor-in-chief and beat writer for JetsInsider.com, part of NYJScout.com. He is Chris Nimbley. Chris, thanks for coming on the Red Sick of Blues podcast. Thanks for having me on, Brad. All right, so I got to ask this first. So I-, I imagine covering the Jets, you were originally a Jets fan, going through the you know the, the torture fan base of being a Jets. Tell me if I'm wrong there. You began as a fan. Uh, yeah, I grew up as a Jets fan. I did, yes. I grew up as a Jets fan most uh, my whole life, and then I got an internship with it uh, with Jets Insider, and then they brought me on full time. So I definitely grew up as a Jets fan. So I, I, I got to ask you, how do you? And I'm, I'm, this is not me ripping on the Jets, but it's you know yeah. they have a history of uh, you know falling short to to be nice. Um, how, how do you make that for having your heart broken so many times? How do you make that transition from being a fan and just having your hands? Your, your head in your hands to being, you know, trying to just report the news and, and be objective? Well, I, I have an advantage over most sports fans where I am able to step back from things. Okay. And not, like, in the moment, especially at first, my first couple of years, in the moment, you can get caught up in it. But then I can step back and then I can, you know, break it apart and look at things more rationally. So you're... And now... Good. And now I, you know, it's it's different now because I've, I've gotten used to it, you know, and I just learned to look at things. I also, with engaging with Jets fans on Twitter, I have a bunch of friends I grew up with who are Jets fans. So I can, and knowing this fan base so well, it's like I can preemptively already know what they're going to say <laughs> and how they're going to react. And I can combat it right off, right away, whether... You know, whether it's good or bad, when things are going really good, I will sit there and take the approach of like, okay, this is really good, but here are the problems. And when things are going really bad, I like to take the approach like, yeah, this is a mess right now, but there's still some glimmers of hope to look forward to. 
to cling on to, to, you know, push on and continue being the fan. Optimism in Jets Nation. Slightly more rational than Joe Beningo. Very good. Very good. <laughs> yes. Um, so I got to ask you, this has nothing to, nothing to do with the Jets, but they're in the division. So I just want to uh, get your reaction to the end of our national saga. That is deflate gate. Your thoughts uh, moving forward doesn't really help the Jets because they're not playing the Patriots uh, until the end of the season. But uh, your immediate reaction once the uh, the saga had concluded. Yeah, my immediate reaction was, you know, like pretty much everybody else. Thank God it's over. Like We're all, we're all sick of uh, talking about it no matter where you fall on it. Even the people who, you know, were totally anti him, and the people who were going hard to protect him, everyone's just sick of talking about it. And you know, we can sit here and we can debate how big of a deal it was or whatever. But I, I don't know how you can read the, the report, the the text messaging between him and the trainers, and not think that he did something on purpose there, and not that he didn't do something. That he wasn't, as they said in the report, that he it was it wasn't uh, generally aware. Generally aware. Of the, but, right. I mean, I don't know how you can actually objectively look at that and say that he wasn't generally generally aware. Yeah. Now it's it's up to each individual person to decide how much they care about that. Does that really matter? And uh, you know, if they have the rules placed in the reason uh, for a reason. Some quarterbacks like the ball a little harder. Some like it a little softer. There's, I talked to players that is a definite advantage to having it all deflated. Now it can work against you in some ways. It'll be harder to throw a 50 yard bomb down the field with a ball like that. But then again, you look at the Patriots and how they run their offense. And it seems they're, they're, hey, that matches up pretty well with what the benefits of the deflated ball are. Yeah, so absolutely. Tom Grady is still great quarterback. I'm not trying to diminish his accomplishments. But, you know, he did something there. And it, and it would be different if it was another team that didn't have a history of stirring the rules as well. Yeah, I mean, that totally did it. I mean, personally, what I think, he's, he totally did it. And he lied about it. I don't think it should be a four-game suspension. If he had probably just told the truth from the beginning, it would probably be yeah. some sort of fine. And then we'd move on and it wouldn't be a topic. He totally did it. I mean, any Patriot fans, I live in Connecticut, so it's sort of battleground in sports and, you know, in baseball and football and, and Patriot fans that don't think he did it. I mean, th- come on, you got to get real with that. Uh, right. Let's 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 look at this. So how did in your mind here, because I think people go back and forth because it was a the season went two different ways. What was your impressions of the first year with Todd Bowles and Mike McCagnan regime? How, how did it go? I think overall it was, you know, a really huge success for the two of them. If you look at, uh, at the way that Bowles came in as his first year head coach, he definitely had, you know, his hiccups, his issues there, including the last game where Sammy Watkins continued to beat, uh, Darrell Revis and he didn't make adjustments in certain situations like that. And there was definitely some hiccups there, but overall, and especially the way the players bought into him and seemed to follow him, I, I think, you know, first-year coach, he's going to have some bumps in the road. I think he did a really good job, though, and you can see signs of him being a really good coach. And McCagnan, the way he went about it, now, I said this off se- this past off season would end up telling us more about McCagnan than the, his first one because he had all this money to spend. Mm-hmm. To go out and make one of the signings he did, while they were good signings and he, he was smart to do it, it's hard to really give him credit for it because they just had money to burn, just go out and spend. But if you look at the way he structured the contracts, the way he's constantly talking about, and this we'll talk about this with the Fitzpatrick stuff coming up, about maintaining leverage for the, and flexibility for the future with the salary cap. So you see him signing everybody, and, and Idrick did this too a little bit. You see them signing guys to what essentially is a two-year or a three-year deal at most to maintain that leverage and flexibility in the future. And he, the kind of, you know, there's the only move I disagreed with in free agency last year was I thought he paid too much for Antonio Cromarty. I didn't think after getting Revis and Screen that that was necessarily worth it. But, and, you know, he's made, was it smart for him to draft Petty? Probably not, but it was a fourth round pick. I'm not going to uh, bang him on too much on trying to take a shot there. So there's a lot to like, yeah, you know, drafting Leonard Williams, sticking to the board, saying best player available, that's where we're going. 
I think mm-hmm. he's shown right now that he's, and again, we'll talk about this with Fitzpatrick, he's got his his idea of what he wants to do, his blueprint, and he's going to stick to it, and he's not really going to compromise that for anything. Yeah, like you said, with Fitzpatrick, he, he's sticking with the blueprint here. Ryan Fitzpatrick, uh, this is going on. I mean, here we are. We're in the middle of July, end of July. Screw that. We're at the end yeah. of July, and Ryan Fitzpatrick is nowhere to be seen. I mean, the only – well, that's not true. We've seen the uh, – uh, let's see, the the, the Pablo, oh. San, Pablo Sandoval-like uh, <laughs> – picture where people want to debate if he's putting on a few pounds or just the you know the, the angles of the shirt regardless he's not there the house is for rent Manish Mehta and his uh, always friendly sources are saying that the New York Jets are been offering him contracts three years 24 million 50 million guaranteed they've been rejected what is going on with Ryan Fitzpatrick yeah you know it's t- it's it's not kind of. It's beyond ridiculous at this point. <laughs> I mean, because really. you, you got to think about it, honestly. I mean, and not to cut you off, but what what are the Jets thinking like right now if, if their season – I mean, they have a tough schedule coming up. Their season is resting here on if we can sign Ryan Fitzpatrick. Well, that, that's what I think it is, is right now. They're sitting there saying, yeah, we want you back, but you're Ryan Fitzpatrick. Like, <laughs> Remember that. Yeah, like we're not going to sit here and go through all this and move heaven and earth for Ryan Fitzpatrick, a 33-year-old vet who's never made the playoffs in his life, who has had the, yes, he had the best year of his career, but he also was with Shane Gailey again. Obviously, the rest of the NFL doesn't believe in Ryan Fitzpatrick without Shane Gailey. And I keep hearing people say, they just need to up the offer, just up the offer. And what, I don't understand this because you never hear this with any other guy. <laughs> when Revis is going through his holdouts, if he's greedy, he's selfish, right, this right. and that. And everyone says, no, to pay Ryan Fitzpatrick. And if Ryan Fitzpatrick had other offers from other teams out, I could understand that thinking. But he's got nobody else in the league willing to offer him anywhere near what the guests are offering him. And people are still saying, meet in the middle no why why think Nobody about think about a me. think about a year and a half ago if someone said you have to pay ryan fitzpatrick give him the money you want he wants you'd have them committed right yeah well and then there was the uh boomer siason thing a, a week or so ago where he said the patent and that stuff because he didn't sign into a long-term deal as oh, soon please. as he traded for him <laughs> Like, yeah, okay, great, great Captain Hindsight there. Absolutely. Boomer. I mean, yeah, sure, it would have been nice if they could have locked him up at for $8 million a year then. But, I mean, who would do that? There was no evidence that Ryan Fitzpatrick it was going to be this great. And even as great, good of a season as he had last year, they still didn't make the playoffs. He still melted down against Buffalo. He still had that terrible game against the Texans. He still had the terrible game against the Eagles. And everyone's so anti Zeno. Geno's a turnover machine, this and that. Well, guess who turns the ball over historically just as much as Geno Smith? Ryan Fitzpatrick. He turns the ball over over uh, one turnover per game. He has not historically been – he's not an Alex Smith. He's not somebody who you're going to trust not to make those bad decisions. He still does those too, but he doesn't have the ability to stretch the field quite as much. So I can understand why the Jets are sitting there thinking, like, listen, okay, yes, it would be very nice to have you. But, again, even let's say they pay, paid him $10 million a year. Geno Smith is getting a million and a half this year, a little bit over that, I think. You're, so you're going to tell me that Ryan Fitzpatrick's eight, worth eight and a half million more than Geno Smith? I have a hard time seeing that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, not, I'm not trying to compare the talent level, but it kind of reminds me when Derek Jeter was actually contemplating leaving the Yankees uh, when he had this enormous contract with them later in his career. It's like, you know, right. Derek, the Kansas City Royals are not going to pay you $24 million a year to, you know, hit 260. It's not happening. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's betting against himself. But you, you bring up Geno Smith. Uh, you, you betting for himself, excuse me. Uh, uh, you bring up Geno Smith. Now... I think that name, when you say it to Jets fans, I mean, there's just like a shudder. You know, it's a Mr. Burns sort of shudder. Um, Are you ready to give Geno Smith the keys to the castle here if Ryan Fitzpatrick wants to play, continue to play hardball? Uh, I'm more than ready. I absolutely want to do that. This is what I want to see. And this is not, uh, there is no Jets fan bias in me. And this, 
this is just me saying I want to see what Geno Smith can do with a real offense under an offensive coordinator who will work with him. Everybody, I I can't stand and I don't under I don't understand how people say this. We know what Geno Smith is because he came out of West Virginia where they ran that air raid offense, but it didn't even have a playbook. He gets thrown in immediately to start in the West Coast offense, which is the most difficult offense for a quarterback to grasp. He has Jeremy Curley and Clyde Gates as his receivers. And even the second year when he had Decker, Decker was hurt with that bad hamstring for most of the year. Now, he only missed the, the one game and then a couple halves here and there, but you could tell he was hurt for most of the season. He's never had this, any type of weapon. He was still coming along and still trying to process all this stuff. I still don't – everybody wants immediate results, immediate results. And that's not how it works. Like even Andrew Luck came out hot right out the gate, and then he struggled last year. Because playing quarterback is really, really hard. And for where he came from out of West Virginia, I, I just want to see what he can do. He is more naturally gifted. He has a better arm than Fitzpatrick. It's, I just think that he has a higher ceiling. He has a lower floor. But if you're going to say we know what, Either of those two are. We know what Brian Fitzpatrick is. Over 10 years in the league, you know what you are. You yeah, don't get yeah. magically better at that point. The third year, remember, it wasn't too long ago when it was the third year that is when we expected the quarterbacks to take the jump. And Gino had a great training camp last year. He was Everything was looking really good. He would have been the starter if not for the IK punching him in the jaw, saying that would have been his third year. And somehow we just magically forget about that, and we just want it right away. And if you're not good right away, then you're trash forever. And I, I, I want to see what he could do with Eric Decker, with Brandon Marshall, with the uh, Matt Forte and Bilal exactly. Powell he, there. He's th- he's going to be throwing to a a a wide receiving core that just leaps and bounds better than what he did a year or two ago. Exactly. And like, uh, Fitzpatrick had a great year last year, but I mean, let's not sit here and act like that's Ryan Fitzpatrick as much as Brandon Marshall was out of his mind. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, now, let's say Ryan Fitzpatrick just sort of waits around, waits for a uh, you know quarterback to get hurt, jumps in there, and Geno Smith is the starter. You got Petty behind him. You have Hackenberg uh, out of Penn State. You are not a fan, and uh, you made that quite uh, well known <laughs> for NYJScout.com. Tell me why you're going to stick to your guns on this about Hackenberg. Well, I mean, I'm I after I wrote the article right away after they drafted him, I just wanted to get out in front of it because I spent most of his college career being like, I don't see it with this kid. I sat there and I would watch all the Penn State games because I kept hearing about this kid, how great he is, and I don't see it with him. And what I see is a big kid with a strong arm. And that's what people fall in love with. If you have oh, yeah. a, if you if you're tall and you got a big arm, people will anoint you right away. And the the strong arm thing is always a touch twenty two with me because I think it ends up for most quarterbacks it ends up doing more harm than good because you try to do too much with it. Mm-hmm. Rare is the guy, the Aaron Rodgers, who has an absolute cannon but doesn't unleash it until he needs to. You usually have somebody who's much more of like a Jeff George. Or even a Brett Favre. As great as Brett Favre was, he was always getting himself in trouble because he had that live arm and he would try to force it. So I watched the Hackenberg and I was very vocal while he was in college about how I just didn't see it. So I thought it was important for me to come out and be like, yeah, I'm not hiding. I'm not running from my criticism of the past couple of years. But at the same time, I'm not going to judge him from college anymore. College is over. That's gone. It's over. I'm just going to judge him from now on from what I see in with the Jets. And it's uh, it's I'm not the, a, a great uh, you know somebody that everyone should just follow a line. If uh, if I say a quarterback is going to be good or great or terrible, you don't have to listen to me. I could very well be wrong. So I will give him the opportunity and the chance and every chance to prove me wrong. And he's gonna it's going to take time. The Jets do not want him to start this year. Ideally, they wouldn't want him to start next year unless he just has some insane leap. But, you know, so I'm willing for him to prove me wrong. I'll, I'll be here, and if he proves me wrong and he turns out good, I will stick by what I said, and I will sit there and I will eat that crow 
and I will let everybody laugh at me. It's going to be extremely interesting when you introduce him uh, when he gets into Canton, and uh, you know, it's a, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. No, just messing with you. Um, we we talked we, we we talked a little positive, a little negative. Let's talk positive here, though. Muhammad Wilkerson is a New York Jet for the next five years on paper. That is, were you shocked by this extension and? Was it a fair deal for both sides? I mean, my math is is terrible. I needed accounting and basic geometry for high school requirements. So how does he look on the open market? Was it good for both sides? Uh, you know, it's, first off, uh, yes, I was absolutely shocked. And uh, the funny thing about it is even as far as towards the end of last season, I was arguing that it's, the Jets could sign him long term and it makes sense for them to do that because of the way that the years are spread out with him and Sheldon and Leonard Williams. They don't. It's not like they have to pay them all at the same time. And this Muhammad Wilkerson deal is really essentially a three-year deal. So then by that time, the third year is when they'd have to pay Sheldon or franchise him. Leonard Williams would still be on his rookie deal. And then after that, they could move on from Wilkerson or they could move on from Sheldon. And then they could worry about Leonard Williams down the line. I think it it was definitely shocking, though, by the time it happened, just because of everything leading up to it, just the way the negotiations were going, how long Wilkerson had been trying to get a new deal with the Jets and how everything was, they weren't even close, they weren't even close. And I, I think it turned out to be a better deal for the Jets. Um, I, I think Muhammad was like, okay, I, he really wanted the, the security, though, and he would have preferred to be on the open market if he was on the open market and other teams could have bid without having to give anything up and this and that, then he would have gotten a better offer from somebody else. There's no doubt about that. But it was important for him to stay in New Jersey, being a Jersey kid. He talked about wanting to, you know, his kids to grow up in Jersey. So they, they found that middle ground where they gave him enough financial security for the future. And he was able to stay here. He got, he's very well liked and respected inside that locker room, and he's comfortable here. So it's a better deal for the Jets because he could have gotten more on the open market. But I think it, when you add everything up, all things considered, it's a good deal for both sides. Yeah, fifty-three million guaranteed. I can't be you know crying for Muhammad right, uh, Wilkerson. Exactly. Uh, I think you sort of answered my next question, but I'll ask it anyway. Here, uh, you, you sort of broke down how the the big three there can be paid. I guess my initial question was, how does this deal affect Sheldon Richardson going forward? Did they essentially choose their man here? Did they draw a line in the sand? Or, or do you stand by what you just said there, that they, they can make this happen? This isn't choosing sides. You know, you sort of have, I don't want to call Rich uh, Wil- Wilkerson the golden boy, but you have Richardson, who's been, you know, less than uh, a uh, image of uh, citizenship right. that the Jets want to uh, portray. Uh you think that they can keep all three together in the next few years and make everyone happy too? They they definitely can. Well, whether they will or not is another story, and I think there's two things that will depend on that. And that's one is Sheldon staying out of trouble. Uh, if, if he continues to stay, if he stays out of trouble, it doesn't make any more problems off the field and whatnot. Then that, they will probably look to keep them. The other thing is they have to figure out the best way to use all three of them. because And that was one of the areas, the, the, the knock I had on Todd Bowles last year, because they were using Sheldon as an outside linebacker a lot, and that just didn't work out very well. And if you're going to use one of the three, then you're going to use Sheldon at that spot, but that's, you, that's a watering down Sheldon Richardson's ability and talent to an insane degree. There's no need, if you have a player as talented and as disruptive as Sheldon Richardson use him in the best way possible. And they didn't do that last year. So they're going to have to find a way to balance the three of them to find some type of rotation. You know, maybe they just mix and match, rotate them in and out more. Maybe they fly Muhammad or Sheldon inside more of a nose tackle. They're going to have to figure that out. But if they can figure out a way to efficiently use all three of them, Sheldon stays out of trouble, then yeah, I think there's a good chance for the next two or three years at least that the three of them stay together. And then uh, by the time the, the third year of Muhammad's deal is done, then I could see them moving on from him and sticking with Jeff Sheldon and Leonard Williams. 
you know, you like you said, it all rests on uh, a lot of Sheldon staying out of trouble. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to act as if he's some sort of monster, but there there have been right. issues off the field we all know. Um, a position that you talk about Todd Bowles putting guys in certain spots. I mean, something that's neglected in this offense here is the tight end position, which I mean, the Jets had eight receptions last year. I've never that that's on 23 attempts. That's 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 mind boggling. Um, yeah. Chase, it's it, it's insane actually. In reality, yeah. eight eight receptions. I mean, that's just pathetic. Um, but Ch- Jason Morrow is back. For, he was last year, obviously sat out with shoulder surgery. Is this this is basically his job, right? I mean, he he can do better than eight receptions, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know the tight end position was a disaster last year, and some of that was the offense. Some of that was Brandon Marshall and Eric Decker. But most of that was Jason Morrow got hurt. And then you're sitting there and you're relying on – and Zach Sutto got hurt too. So you're sitting there relying on Kellen Davis. And that's – you're not – if Kellen Davis is the guy you're looking to, you're going to find someplace else to look. Yes. Um, so if Jason Morrow can come back and stay healthy, I talked to him a lot during the off uh, – during OTAs and mini camps, and he, he's got a real positive attitude. He feels really comfortable with the offense, with the system, with the rest of them. He's very happy to be able – He's. I talked to him, I remember asking him, I was like, how frustrating was it to sit on the sidelines and watch last year because you're sitting there watching Eric Decker and Brandon Marshall put up all these yards and score all these touchdowns, and you got to be sitting there thinking, man, if I could just be in there with those guys, like they're going to draw all the attention, and it's just going to be me just running down the oh, team man. wide open. Smorgasbord of receptions, absolutely. Right. And he just kind of looked at me, and this big, huge grin lit up on his face, and he was like, it was super frustrating, but like he, he was like beaming with excitement about what that could mean for this year. And, you know, his, first, his rookie year, he had those drop issues, but you could even tell he was having them during training camp. You could tell he was still in his head. He was thinking too much. He was running his routes. I think that if he can stay healthy, with the other weapons around, and again, with Forte and Powell, cause I, I'm going to keep talking about those two over and over again because I'm not sure that they, we're talking about it enough. Their ability to catch the ball out of the backfield, it, it gets struggled so much last year finding that third receiver. Now they have, uh, and Powell was here last year, but they didn't use him until the, a lot until the end. With Forte and him, they can be the third receiver if Amaro is not doing stepping up, and then all of a sudden he's the fourth option, and that should definitely do it. So there's just so many different mismatches and different ways they can go that I think there's there's a lot there's going to be a lot more uh, for the, whoever the quarterback is to spread around a lot more options for them to choose from. You bring you bring up Forte, and uh, you know you have a 30 year old Matt Forte coming in off his worst season statistically of his career, probably, and you say goodbye to a 28 year old Chris Ivory who probably had one of the best statistical uh, seasons of his career. How are you? And this is no disrespect to Powell, but I mean, how, how are you sitting with the the switch here, the premier backs, or is it just really come down to years and dollars? Because uh, you know Ivory got a pretty nice deal. Yeah, um, I, here's the thing, because. You know, the 30, year, 30 years is usually that magical number yes. for running back. Yes, it right? is. But Matt Forte is not the pounded up the gut running back. And he, if you're using him more as a receiver, not that he won't take it up in the middle and do that, but that's going to limit some of the wear and tear on him. His ability as a receiver is going to limit some of that for him. So I'm not sure. It could still apply. The 30-year-old uh, rule could still apply to him. But I'm not sure that it applies to him as much as somebody else. And, yes, Ivory is younger. But anybody who's watched Ivory in his career, the thing that makes him great is also his biggest weakness. He, why he's so good is because of his running style, because of the way he lowers his shoulder and just runs people over. But at the same time, that leads to injuries. And one of the worst problems with, with him is that you never know when they're coming. And then all of a sudden, there was a couple of weeks, even you know the last week against Buffalo, there was a couple other weeks, uh, the Patriots game. You're sitting there going, okay, we're expecting to have Ivory for 20, 25 touches, and then all of a sudden he gets hurt right away at the beginning of the game or he can't be used. So it's a, a double-edged sword there, and 
I I also love the idea of having Cal and Forte because they are similar. And, you know, in the NFL, typically what teams do is they go with the, with the thunder and light, you know? Right, right. But I, I think it's better if you have uh, two running backs who can do similar things. So last year when Ivory was on the field, more often than not, they were going to run the ball. When Powell was on the field, more often than not, they were going to pass the ball. Now, when they come on, when Forte's in there or Powell's in there, you don't, you can't sit there and say, oh, they're going to run it now. Oh, they're going to pass it now. Because both of them can run the ball, both of them are good receivers, and both of them can pass the pass. And Kyrie Robinson, if he gets healthy and comes back and do the same. I think he'll get a lot of the goal line catches. But right now you've got three running backs, and the defense isn't going to be able to gauge anything one way or the other from that. And I think that's a huge benefit to the whole, the whole offense. They can both run the ball, and again, they're going to help the quarterback out. So we looked at the offense, we looked at the defense. Let's look at this just wretched schedule, especially in the beginning for the New York Jets. I want to ask you your prediction for the season. Let's just quickly go through these games here. First game of the year, Cincinnati. How does that look? Yeah, I mean, I I think that they – wait, is that Cincinnati? They've got Cleveland to face, don't they? Or or am I looking at the – no, I think I see Cincinnati. No, I might be messing that up. Um, uh, Cincinnati will, will be a tough game, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it'll depend. They've lost some of the receivers, so how explosive is that offense going to be now? They still have A.J. Green, of course. But that's it's, that's not an unwinnable game, especially I, I know that first week is definitely at home. It's not an unwinnable game. Take a stand I don't here, know Chris. That I would. Win or loss, take a stand. All right. Uh, I, I'm, I'll go and say it's a loss. But it's, okay. it's not an unwinnable game. No, I, I agree completely. You got at Buffalo the next game. Back to the scene of the crime, the the, the last game of the season last year where Ryan Fitzpatrick melted. Yeah. And now that's, that's one of those Thursday night games. So that's, uh, you know, those are always a toss-up when you have teams that are evenly, close to evenly matched. And I think they pretty much are. But I'm going to go ahead and say that you have to get a little bit of revenge in that game. And they're going to win that game. We'll end up because first of all, that would be perfect Jets right there. They get the <laughs> revenge game in week two when it yeah. doesn't end up mattering. And of course, they play Buffalo again at the end of the season. Where you exactly? exactly. Uh, so yeah. the next next one, two, three, four games, uh, three of them around the road, and the road games are Kansas City, Pittsburgh, and Arizona, which is just really unfair. And then they have a home game. You know, they reward them with Seattle. Uh, yeah. I I gotta think that these quite possibly are all four losses. Well, the Pittsburgh game is interesting. Uh, you know, with with how's that offense going to look? Now I know Le'Veon Bell will be back by that time, but and they'll still have Antonio Brown, but no more Davis Bryant. Le'Veon Bell. Know. Le'Veon Bell says he's not missing a game either. He's he he he's telling everyone he's don't worry about it. My missed test. It's okay. I'm allowed to do oh, what I want. Yeah, well, he says a lot of things. Uh, Have you noticed he, he, that all? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Have you noticed that like all week it's been like about weed in the NFL? It's it's Le'Veon Bell, it's Alden yeah. Smith smoking blunts on uh, live streaming it, and Josh yeah. Gordon is back That's in the league. Back. Yeah, I know, and it, this is a big topic of conversation. Of all the things that we that they have to worry about with the players in the NFL, you just let them smoke some weed, man, and like especially. You know, I get the – Josh Gordon, he he was going a little far with it. It seemed like he might have had an issue with it. But I know for a fact that a lot of players sit there and, you know, it's – obviously there's a couple of states where it's completely legal. But then there's also way more states where it's legal medically. And a large part of the reason for the medicinal marijuana is for pain management. Exactly. And if these players want to sit here and say – Hey, let me go home and smoke a joint and, and release some of the tension in my bones, in my body. Let me do that instead of taking the, the highly addictive painkillers. Then, yeah, let them go ahead and do that. I'd also rather them sit at home and smoke some weed than go out to the bars and clubs and then hop in their car and you get caught drunk driving or get in a fight outside the club or you know, pull a plastico and drop their gun and shoot themselves or something. I think the only issue, and I'm I'm all for weed being legal and everything, it's just you can't have 
Well, the one thing the NFL, I guess, could get around it is they just won't test for it because you can't right. just say, oh, Go the well, NBA route. Yeah. They go the NBA route. They just, you just don't test for it. It's that simple. And now the one the one argument against that is they kind of sort of almost do that already is if if you have never been uh, busted with any test, drug test with them you're not in the drug program you just have to fail you just have to pass that one test at the beginning right. of the year and that that's what they call the dummy test exactly you're, I mean these guys that fail that thing I mean cut, get get your priorities together I mean, geez, right. come on <laughs> right so. <laughs> If they can just pass that, then then they're good to smoke the rest of the year if they want to, and then they just got to know to pass it the next year. The problem is when they fail that one, and then the tests become random. But again, there's so many other things that we're worried about: domestic violence, steroids, this and that, the painkiller addiction. Just let them smoke weed, man. This is where we're going. It's you know, it's only going to be a matter of time before it's legal everywhere at this point. Just exactly. get out in front of it, or at least stop testing for it. <laughs> That's the way to get around it. And if and if Roger Condell, if Roger Condell knows how to do anything, it's get around things. Exactly. Um, uh, so let's look at this real quick. So Kansas City, what do you think? At Kansas City, win or loss? I'm going to go with a loss there. I, I, I'd be a little more bullish on their chances if it was at home. Kansas City is just a tough place to play. In Seattle, that that's even though that's at home, that's a tough one. I mean that they're still a great team. Well, the, the, the one that the, I would, on its face, you sit here and say Seattle easily, and I'm not trying to run from that. But there They have that the, big travel. To, yeah, right. So. There is that whole West Coast team traveling east, which bears out like that does have an effect on people. So they might be able to steal that game. But if you're asking me to pick that right now, I'm going to go ahead and pick the Seahawks. Okay, so you you li- you kind of liked them at Pittsburgh, right? Is that that what we're saying here? October 9th, so we're getting into the season here. So are you you you're gonna, you, it sounded yeah, as if you I'll, were ready to give an endorsement. Yeah, I'll go ahead and say they win that Pittsburgh game. And okay. first of all, you know, anytime this is why obviously fans love going through the schedule. Who doesn't love going through the schedule? Going win loss, win loss, but it never works out exactly like you no, think never. it will. So I feel like that's a, a perfect game that everyone's going to say, "Oh, that's." Count it as a loss, and that'll be one of the games that they win. I can see that being. I mean, I'm, I'm picking spreads here in what week five, six. I can see that exactly. Steelers being favored five or six right there, and the Jets winning by about two or three. Exactly. Right, and their defense isn't. They're not the old Steelers defense. This defense isn't anything crazy. No, so no. It's, as long as they don't have a crazy offense, and with again Bryant being out, and with uh, the Jets defense being as good as it is. I, I I definitely think that they can win that game, and, I, and I'll go ahead and pick that now. So Arizona away, I mean, that's you got to yeah. think that's yeah, a, that, that's a loss. <laughs> yeah. uh, Baltimore at home, I, I, I'm going to say the Jets there. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm going to go with the Jets there too. Ever since Baltimore gave Flacco that contract, they just can't, don't have enough money to fill out the rest of their roster. <laughs> the defense isn't there. They don't have the weapons to Flacco to throw to anymore. They don't have, uh, you know, Ray Rice in his heyday being able to control the game, the uh, game on the ground. The Ravens don't scare me. I, I, the Jets should win that game. And uh, so this is when they play Cleveland, and they are playing at okay. Cleveland on October 30th. What do you think there? I mean, you got Robert Griffin, a uh, d- d- bit of a new look to the Browns, but I don't see them really being world beaters. Yeah, no. You, it, I'm, I'm more on... The Robert Griffin still has a chance to be good if you can stay, stay healthy, especially under Hugh Jackson, than most people are. But, I mean, I'm, they're, they're still the Browns. They're still the Cleveland Browns. They're still, they'll have Josh Gordon back by that time, but he hasn't played in a couple of years. At, Who they knows? Draft, I know is. they, right. And I know they drafted 18 receivers this year, but you're going to have a bunch of rookie receivers other than Gordon to throw to. That that offense isn't going to scare anybody. That defense isn't that great, and I, you know if RG three can stay healthy, T Jackson I think was a bit higher for them, but they're a couple of years away, and the Jets should be able to win that game pretty easily. And then you got at Miami. Um, that one could go either way, in my opinion. Yeah, that's Miami and the Jets are always like that. The, the you know the Dolphins will be the clearly better team. The Jets will beat them. The Jets will be the clearly better team. The Dolphins will beat them. But the Jets are 
the, the Jets are the better team right now, whoever the quarterback is. Um, so I'll say the Jets, but that, that's always a hard game to say. Yeah. Uh, then before the bye, November 13th, the last game before the bye, and that will be the L.A. Rams, the St. Louis Rams. Still the same yeah. personnel. Yeah, still the same personnel, still the same coach, 8-8 eight eight, Jeff Fisher. <laughs> um, you know, they, they the guy all... who continues to just be praised every year when he is merely 500 at best. Yeah, I don't understand how he still has a job. I got nothing against him personally. I don't know the guy. <laughs> but it's like, how? I don't get it. Eight and eight every year or seven and nine. It's, and that team, I mean, they don't really have weapons. I mean, Todd Gurley is an amazing running back, but the Jets defense isn't the team that's going to just get gassed on the ground. And unless you have crazy wide receivers to open that up, which they don't have, they're going to have golf playing, I'm sure, and the five bowls and that defense will confuse them enough. I just I don't see how the Jets will lose that game unless they do something super Jetsy. All right, so super Jetsy. Uh, so we're at five and four at the bye. Next game after after Thanksgiving here, it is uh, the New England Patriots. So they usually seem to, you know, it, it, I don't want to say they usually seem because I don't have the stats going back in yesteryear, but it seems like they always have maybe have a little split every year. Or am I crazy? No, you're not crazy. I, I think uh, that it's more towards the Patriots winning both of the games than a split every year. But the Jets do always, almost always, except for, you know, butt fumble exceptions. They always play a good game. Here there. Yeah, they always play in tough. The Patriots aren't quite as good as they have been in years past. They, you know, I think they match up really well with them. I, I so I'm going to say that they'll split that series against the Patriots this year too. You know, yeah. then who knows which which one will the win or which one they'll lose. But I think they'll split. So we got Indianapolis after that. Uh, I mean, that that's a team that I'm not. I can't really think of all the any moves that they've made in the off season that were big. Um, it was just Andrew Luck had a tough year last year with the pieces around him. Right, and what's going to be huge for them is how that offensive line comes together. Because again, if at all. Hit, right now they went and they drafted a bunch of guys. So maybe, and sometimes offensive linemen can come in right away and be really good. It's also not going to be hard to improve on the offensive line last year. So in in Luck's first couple of years, the offensive line was terrible too. It just wasn't as bad as last year. Um, their defense has some players in there but they're nothing scary and so unless that offensive line is just that much that much better than last year i think the Jets can win that game so all right so we're at seven and five the next game at san francisco you're going west coast i'm not even saying that the 49ers are that good it's just like we we're saying with seattle going back across the coasts present yeah. it might present a problem for the jets yeah it's exactly the same thing with seattle right now like if you tell me I'm gonna I'm gonna say the Jets are the better team, the Jets should win that game. Um, whether it's Colin Kaepernick or Blaine Gabbert, it really shouldn't matter. And especially, it, but if it is Blaine Gabbert, then Jesus, I don't know how they can lose that game. But that West Coast trip, we've seen that fight the Jets before. That's gonna be tough. But I'm I don't know how I can in good conscience that at least at this stage sit here and get the Jets to lose that 49ers team. Oh, so you think they're going to win? I mean, uh, the West Coast, the trip West Coast scares me. Uh, right. It does. But that defense isn't very good. Chip Kelly, what's Chip Kelly going to do? Is he going to adjust? Because that's one of the worst things. If he's still running that super up tempo offense, the biggest problem with that offense is it only works if you can get into a rhythm and have success. Because if you're rushing the offense all the time, then all of a sudden you're sitting there and you just keep putting your defense back out there. And the defense isn't good, and then you're going to make them get them tired out by the end of the first quarter? Like, I, I just don't see that as a good match for them. Maybe down the road they can build it more to, to his shooting. But I think the 49ers are going to be really bad this year. I mean, like, I'm talking about four wins. Yeah, four win ceiling. And obviously that West Coast trip, and again, it would be pretty jetsy to go ahead and 
be one of those few teams that loses to them. But I, I, again, in good conscience, sitting here in July, I just I can't sit here and pick the 49ers to win that game. So we got Miami afterwards. Uh, we said Miami, the Jets will win that first game, but they could split that easily with Miami as well. Yeah. And then we already said they'd split with New England. And then the last game, January 1st, New Year's Day, Buffalo to end the season again. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that, and that's going to how I would pick that game would probably depend on what you're telling me is at what stakes they're at that, on that game. That's right true. There. Is, is it a playoff? Is it a win on your end type of situation? Because then I'm going to be a little more nervous about it. If it's not, then I'm not going to be as nervous about it. I also, you know, I, I covered Rex for every year here except for his first year. I came in his second year here. And I, I, I can't see him really improving on that team much. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Buffalo takes a pretty big step back even this year than they were last year. And they have some players, whether it's Sammy Watkins, or Sammy Watkins going to be healthy at that point. He's had a lot of injury concerns in his career. Uh, is Tyrod Taylor even going to be able to duplicate his season last year? If you're going to ask me to pick that game right now, I'll, I'll say the Jets can win. But, you know, obviously there's a great chance they could lose that game too. So we got 9-7 and seven or 8-8 eight and eight depending. So we'll have to see. They play the games for a reason. Uh, total cliche BS there, but that's the facts. Um, yeah. I want to thank Chris for coming on the Red Ticket Blues podcast. But before you go to play us out, I have three quick questions. You ready? Absolutely. All right. So outside of Jets fans, because uh, you already told us that um, you know you, you're ready for their for them giving you crap or, or just flipping out on Twitter. So outside of Jets fans, what fan base gives you the most crap either on Twitter or comments on stories? Um. You know, I. Well, I, I guess you would have to go with the Patriots uh, on Twitter and comments and stuff because. The, the Patriots, and it's deserved, but they have that arrogance of, uh, yeah, yeah, whatever you say. And, like, the Jets can sit there and everything can be looking great, but they'll just come and be like, yeah, yeah, whatever you say. We own you, this and that. And, it, you know, it's hard to argue with them. They're, they're right. But, right. you know, sometimes the Jets will go into Foxborough and win a playoff game there. Um, now, in, in real life, in everyday life, I I live in North Jersey. I've lived here since I was in fourth grade, so it's definitely the Giants yeah. because the Giants fans are uh, a special breed. Well, it, it's the big brother, little brother. I mean, that that just I watch those exchanges on Twitter, just watching it with popcorn, just nonstop. I mean, it, you're right; it never ends. Um, well, and yeah, and the thing special with, breed. With is, now, this obviously this applies to all fan bases, but because I'm in North Jersey, I see it more with the Giants fans. Yeah. And I sit there and I tell them, I'm like, listen, if I know more about your team, then you don't get to give me crap for it. <laughs> and like, I know more about the Giants than most Giants fans I know. So, it's that, again, that can apply to a, a, every fan base, every fan base that's individual fans. But I deal with it a lot from the Giants fans because living in North Jersey. Completely fair. Um what jet, if any, will lead the league in a statistical category this year? Ooh. Huh. That's a good question. There doesn't have to be, like I said, if any. Yeah, I don't know that. I mean, you could maybe get... Uh, yeah, I don't see anybody... I don't. I don't see anybody. I, I'll, I'll guess if I'm going to say anybody, it would be Brandon Marshall with some type of receiving, whether it's touchdowns, yards, catches, maybe catches, big touchdown. I'd say he's their best bet to get that. Okay. And finally, uh, be honest. Are any of the Jets playing Pokemon Go out there? And uh, if they are, please name them so we can shame them right now. Well, I, we haven't had any. Uh, you know, OTAs and minicamps ended before Pokemon Go started, so uh, I, I don't have a answer right. for you there. Jesus. But, but I have a very good feeling that there will probably be some Pokemon Go questions starting on Wednesday with check-in bags. And, uh, and, and I can guarantee you there's a couple of them that are definitely out there playing it, whether they're, you know, I don't know that there's any out there that are 
in danger of falling off a cliff while chasing <laughs> Pokemon or anything like that. But uh, these, especially the younger players, they like their technology. They like their stuff. I know that there's a couple out there that are definitely giving it a shot. So, for, and this is, it's too big of a topic. And it's, it's actually a training camp story. It's a nice, fun story. So right. I'm sure I won't be the only one trying to uh, look into that. I completely forgot about the time gap with the OTAs. Oh, man. Damn it. I wanted names. All right. Yeah. Anyways, uh, training camp starts on the 27th. Uh, he is the editor in chief at the and beat writer, jetsinsider.com, nyjscout.com. Chris Nimbley, you can follow him on Twitter at C Nimbley. Chris, thanks for coming on the Red Ticket Blues podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, Brian. So there's Chris Nimbley. You got your Jets fix. You're ready for the training camp and the season of football where we all become ravenous animals. Looking forward to it. Uh, remember, you can always listen to the show on iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play. Follow me on Twitter at BrianBuck13 and at RedTicketBlues. Uh, remember to subscribe if you don't want to miss an episode and leave a review if you're a decent human being. If you're not, you won't leave a review. So I, I can see that happening already. Uh, So with all that being said, everyone, I'm out of here.